morning, everybody. Welcome to the Occupational Health Center's uh, fall seminar titled uh, somewhat oddly Season of the Witch, relating to which as an adjective, which COVID vaccine, which test, which treatments, and a couple of other topics related to COVID. Thanks to all of you for joining. I I'm sure some will join in progress here. I'll start with um, a little bit of a disclaimer, might be an apology, might be a welcomed invitation to some. Many, some of you know I was an English major as an undergraduate. So how any given presentation goes, whether it's going to be a lot of data with occasional interruptions with more poetic and lyrical items, or mostly poetic and lyrical with occasional interruptions from data, all depends on whether I wake up on the left side or the right side of my brain and whether or not I can balance any of that uh, intentionally. So uh, you can be the judge of how things go today. So next slide. Here's our agenda for today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about uh, the current status in the community. I think some of this may be repetitious for those of you who access some of the different sources of the information frequently, whether it's the CDC, or the county's website, going to share some data from the pen system, which obviously you wouldn't see, which is revealing to some degree. But we're going to talk about which testing, which treatments, and which vaccines, talk about when vaccines are going to be available and which ones. And also going to switch gears later in the presentation to talk about what I think is an interesting topic as it relates to the workplace and medical marijuana use, uh, as we'll see in some of the later slides. COVID-related anxiety is on the rise, and with that, the increased use of medical marijuana with an obvious impact on workplace drug testing. So, first slide here just gives the reference again for the title. Uh, Donovan, again, a singer-songwriter from Scotland in the early mid-60s had a song called Season of the Witch was re-recorded later for a movie called Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Uh, Lana Del Rey uh, covered that tune for that movie. The COVID is kind of a scary story, uh, sometimes told in the dark. We're near Halloween, of course, the obvious reference here. But I try to shed a little more light if we can on, on the whole situation. Next slide, please. Some people think of COVID in more lyrical terms, almost like a spell. And again, given the proximity to Halloween, some might even think of it as a spell cast on us by an evil, evil person. These are some lines from a poem from a pretty well-known British poet that talk about the effect of a pandemic on the sensibility. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world and the blood dim tide is loosed. Everywhere, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely, some revelation is at hand. Surely, the second coming is at hand. An intimation here that, that COVID and pandemics in general are almost like an apocalyptic vision here, almost like the blood dim tide rising, uh, anarchy loosed upon the world. Interesting thing about this poet, next slide, is that it was actually William Butler Yeats. And this poem was written in 1920. And part of what was happening at that time uh, in the history of the world, the end of World War II had just occurred a year before, but the influenza pandemic of 1918 and 1919 had recently ended as well. Yeats was affected by this personally. His wife had a very severe case of influenza, fortunately, she recovered, but this poem was inspired by the end of World War I, but also by a pandemic published almost exactly 100 years ago. Uh, the bad news is that some things seem like they changed and remain the same, and the good news is they got over that. They got past that and hopefully we'll do the same thing with COVID. Next slide, please. A picture from the Westchester Halloween Parade, which sadly is not happening this year, a lot of other events that were canceled. The Witches of Westchester, I call this. Now we'll move on to the next slide, which is the new Witches of Westchester. Which test? We have choices here, the usual PCR diagnostic test, the antigen test, 
the antibody test, which treatment, antivirals, we've heard a lot about remdesivir, we've heard a lot about convalescent plasma, and also monoclonal antibodies, the president received a, a dose of those, which vaccine, a lot of companies are contending for that prize, and which hygienic measures, we have masks, we have social distancing, we also have rolling the dice, not doing any of that. Some would say that the surges we're seeing in the upper Midwest are related to people not following the hygienic measures. Believe it or not, rolling the dice is not an unreasonable strategy because the incidence of the disease is still so low. So if you do nothing, you're probably still not going to get it. But of course, it is kind of a crapshoot. Next slide, please. Here are some of the, the stats. Uh, these numbers have changed, of course, every day. We're over 227,000 deaths in the US. 8.5 million cases or more. Um, the peaks that we have talked about are very visible here with that red line tracing the first peak back in March and April, the second one over the summer, and now a third one as we head into late October. The one that was predicted, unfortunately, back in March and April. Next slide. This is a slide that talks about the daily census in all the Penn hospitals for confirmed COVID cases. Those are the blue lines and COVID cases that are under investigation. PUI is person under investigation. And we had that big peak. This is only hospitalized cases now. This is not all cases that are occurring, all cases that are being tested. We've been very fortunate uh, that we've seen uh, these numbers come down. They won't go away though. Next slide. These are the different Penn hospitals with their daily census. Chester County's in the upper left. I showed the similar slide back in June. We did get down to zero over the summer, then up again into the fives and sixes, single digits, up as many as nine, have been under 10 though, as you can see here for a month and uh, feeling fortunate about that. Similar stories in the other Penn hospitals, except for Lancaster General. And uh, they've had a recent surge, as you can see back in mid-October, down in the mid-teens, and then a big jump up to 27 a week ago, well, not a week ago, five days ago, Friday, coming down a little bit. Why? Well, a lot of things to attribute it to. As we had here in Chester County back in May and June, a lot of congregate living settings, uh, nursing homes, of course, the Amish population, congregate living to some degree, some questions about how much they've adopted the, those hygienic measures, the masks and the distancing and so forth. Anyway, Lancaster's had a surge. We hope for their sake it uh, comes down soon. Next slide. This is the daily uh, inflow and outflow of, again, hospitalized patients with COVID. The blue line is the ones that are admitted, some of them for the downtown academic hospitals or patients that are transferred in. The green line is patients that are discharged. So you can see on any given day, we might have relatively more going out or more coming in. More recently, it's been more going out. We hope that that trend continues. Next slide. And these are the inflows and outflows per hospital again. And again, uh, Chester County, upper left, Couple days, we, we've had more coming in than going out, but most days more going out than coming in. Lancaster, the second uh, in the first column, second row, as you can see a big surge uh, a couple of weeks ago, and then uh, more recently, more people discharged. So again, hoping that the trend goes more on the outflow side. Next slide, please. These are hospitalized cases in Chester County, uh, going back to March 24th. All hospitals in Chester County represented here in the uh, upper gray curve. Chester County Hospital itself, the lower red line. And again, you can see um, the numbers have come down pretty dramatically since April and uh, early May. Next slide. County numbers for tested cases and ones that are positive. The upper graph, the light blue is a number of tests done that were negative and the lower darker blue is a number of positives. So still overwhelmingly more negatives than positives, fortunately, but the lower graph is total deaths. And of course this number will continue to go up as long as we have one more death that will add to that total. So the cumulative number will continue to go up until it stops and levels off. Next slide, which we fervently hope for. 
A lot of talk in the news. This is a slide that I actually used back in June because the same conversations were occurring then. Controversy about the value of testing. Yes, of course, if you don't test, you're not going to see as many reported cases, but you're still going to have cases that just won't be reported. I have a family member that lives in, in New York, had very typical COVID symptoms back in March. At the time, we had this quaint notion that you couldn't get COVID unless you were around somebody you knew to be positive or had traveled to China or Italy. So this person wasn't tested. And fortunately, the symptoms resolved, but it was shortness of breath, cough, fever, couldn't taste, couldn't smell. Later had an antibody test to show that it was COVID, but wasn't tested back then. It was still a case, but it wasn't a reported case. So a lot of cases go unreported because people don't get tested. But it's important to realize that the cases that we do report, those eight and a half million for the country, reflect the whole spectrum of severity. Everything from those people that were tested just because they were traveling, or maybe they were coming to a job at a different state and got needed a test to be cleared. Maybe they were exposed to somebody and got tested all the way up to people that are hospitalized on ventilators in an intensive care unit and eventually die. A case is all these things. Fortunately, most of them are in the upper side of this spectrum, the ones that are either asymptomatic or mildly ill and recover. Early on, most of the cases and the deaths were older, sicker, when more deaths occurred in that population, but we were still getting younger people, healthier cases, fortunately, most of them recovered. More recently, the case counts are higher because of younger and healthier people. Some of you may remember a couple of weeks ago, there was an executive order or an emergency order put out in the borough of Westchester to reduce the size of indoor and outdoor gatherings and to enforce mask use because of an increased number of cases in the 18 to 22 year old age range, a dramatic increase in September over August. So we think it's people that are living together still having gatherings and so forth. But anyway, fortunately, most of those are healthier and going to recover. Next slide, please. A lot of anxiety, we mentioned anxiety in the beginning about the, uh, the death counts, the case counts. As I said, they're going to keep going up as long as the virus is still there. As I said earlier, the case counts are going to underestimate the true incidence because of people that don't get tested still are people that don't get tested. The good news is that the rate of increase has been variable. Even though it's going up again now across the country, it may be behavior driven and we've driven it down before and hopefully, presumably, we can drive it down again. Next slide. There was an article written by a San Francisco uh, newspaper or journalist back in the spring that compared what was happening with COVID to what he called the hammer and the dance. And the hammer was the phase when we need the lockdown. We need to make everything very strict. We quarantine, we have bubbles. And then once things get better, we start to gradually kind of dance out back towards some semblance of normal. Restaurants are closed, just doing curbside takeout. Then they open for 25% capacity or just outdoor dining. And then it's indoor. So we're dancing back out. Numbers go back up again hammer it back down again, make the numbers more strict, get better again, dance out again. And his theory was that we're gonna see this alternating hammer and dance until we have a vaccine and or effective treatments. We might be seeing that now as the surges are occurring in other parts of the country, as I say here, it's kind of a tough way to live, but it's also tough to live in lockdown all the time, as we all know, next slide. Reminds me of another old song. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember an artist called Dan Hicks and his hot licks, but he had a song called, How Can I Miss You When You Won't Go Away? And that's kind of how I feel about COVID sometimes. I'd love to be able to miss it, to say I miss the good old days of lockdown, but it just won't go away, at least not yet. Next slide, please. Back in June, I asked the question, what business are you in? Uh, obviously the wide range of industries that utilize our occupational health program, we're very grateful for that. But I told people then, and I still tell them, whatever business you think you, you're in, since March, you've also been in the infection prevention and control business. Next slide. Employer issues that we've heard about early on, 
the questions we get were, what do we do? What if we get a case? Do we shut down completely? Can we just shut down the area where that person worked? How soon can somebody return to work after they've been positive? How about somebody that was just exposed? Should I test my whole workforce? Should it be the viral test? What about the antibody tests? Now we're almost eight months into this. Most companies have pretty much figured out how to do the distancing, the remote work assignments. As we have here in the hospital, many of you have much fancier signs than we had originally. Originally it was duct tape, handwritten signs with Sharpies on floors and now it's fancier signs with distancing and don't sit here. Companies have learned to a large degree how to manage the travelers, people that have been exposed and occasional sporadic cases, how long to quarantine, the criteria for turn to work. We're happy to answer all those questions as we did back in March and April, but it's all publicly available now. People have figured this out. What's still elusive though, how do you identify somebody who's asymptomatic, but may be able to shed or spread the virus anyway, without symptoms or with mild symptoms? We've all been using what I would consider kind of blunt instruments that are surrogates for knowing if somebody has COVID. You check their temperature. How sensitive is that? Not everybody with COVID has a fever or if you're asymptomatic or have a mild case, you won't have a fever. We ask about symptoms. We ask about recent exposures and travel history. Some companies are still asking about testing. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but there's a newer approach that may be a slight improvement over the simple self-reporting. Uh, next slide, please. Different apps that we can use. Here's one called ClearPass, where an employee will download the app on their phone, answer a series of questions, and either get a red light or a green light to go into work. Next slide. Penn has their own branded version of this called Penn Open Pass where it asks, again, the typical questions, new loss of taste or smell, fever or just feeling feverish, vomiting or diarrhea, loss of appetite, breathing, cough. Again, you answer the questions and based on the results, either get a green light to come into work or a red light to stay home, maybe go get tested. These systems aren't perfect. People can game them, depends on how you answer the question. Same as if you're answering a paper questionnaire. You might, be, you might have taken Tylenol or Motrin or be taking it for something other than COVID. Maybe you have musculoskeletal issues that artificially suppress your fever. So these aren't perfect. Probably gonna pick up a few more cases uh, that might be asymptomatic shedders. Jury's still out on how many more we're gonna pick up. People that are checking temperatures have found it uh, not so sensitive a tool. I get my temperature checked every morning when I walk into the hospital. I hear the two beeps, I get the 96.8, which I never knew I was that cool a guy. I mean, I'm kind of cool, but never knew I was that cool. Uh, and then I will go on my way. Anyway, uh, some companies are thinking they want to stop checking temperatures. The State uh, Department of Health, Secretary of Health, Dr. Levine, issued an order back in September or early October that still, or still feels we should be testing temperatures and asking about fever. Next slide. Couple of words about what I'm calling here regulatory alphabet soup before we get into the tests and the treatments and the vaccines. Couple of terms you need to know that have, some of them have become part of our, of our lexicon here in this country. CBRN are the threats that can occur from chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear threats or emerging infectious diseases. A lot of these terms came about after 9-11. And what do you do for a CBRN? Well, you develop MCM, medical countermeasures. And these are gonna be FDA regulated products. They're gonna be used to treat these different threats, whether it's vaccines or blood products or antibodies in the case of viral infections. Could be other drugs like the antiviral drugs. Could be devices, tests that we use to diagnose these issues, or it could be equipment, PPE and ventilators. Next slide. EUA has become a very familiar term, emergency use authorization. Again, after 9-11, Congress gave the Federal Food and Drug Administration the authority to issue these emergency youth use authorizations. The idea was to get medical products, treatments, tests, equipment into the hands of the caregivers to be used on their patients before the usual FDA approval had been done. The FDA has been criticized over the decades for being too slow. 
They've been using this drug in Europe for a decade and our FDA won't approve it yet. We're really hung up on the safety thing. But this gave the FDA the ability to get something into market as quickly as possible, as long as there was some data to indicate that it may be effective. So the standard here for an EUA is may be effective. So there are some data, but not the usual fulsome data the FDA uses to say that something is safe and effective. There's also a consideration of the risk benefit ratio. When you're dealing with a very deadly disease like COVID, you might accept more risk from the treatment for the possible benefit it can provide. And this brings us to the distinction between the risk you're going to accept for treatments versus vaccines. And the key point here is that your treatments are being used on sick people, people with symptoms, people that have maybe even a life-threatening illness. Obviously, your appetite for risk is going to be greater in that case. Vaccines, on the other hand, are given to healthy volunteers, people that aren't sick. Now, of course, they're at risk for being sick, some more at risk than others because of underlying conditions. But still, you're not going to get the vaccine unless you're a healthy volunteer. So your appetite for risk and your demand for more safety, your appetite for risk is lower, your demand for more safety is greater. Next slide, please. Now we have the BLA and the NDA. So vaccines, when they come to market, which will be soon, we'll talk about that later, are going to come to market only with the emergency use authorization. If things go well, they'll eventually get something called a BLA, a biologic license application. The doctor that's in charge of the FDA is somebody we actually know a little bit around here. Dr. Stephen Hahn was actually the chair of Penn's Department of Radiation Oncology for a number of years. And because we at Chester County have a radiation oncology department that's staffed by Penn radiation oncologists, Dr. Hahn was in charge of that program and we got to know him a little bit. He left Penn and went on to um, a program, MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas. And then as of a year ago, he was sworn in as the FDA director. He's been challenged a little bit over some of the recent months about some products that got to market too quickly, like convalescent plasma and hydroxychloroquine. But he's standing by the decision to use the EUA for vaccines. He's saying here, it's the right path. The BLA would be too long because you've got something that's too deadly. You got a pandemic, you've got to get something into the hands of caregivers and into our patients a little more quickly. So remdesivir, the antiviral we're gonna talk about in a minute, was initially released with an EUA, an emergency use authorization, but recently it was approved for an NDA, a new drug application. So now it's got full FDA approval. We'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide. So which test? Three different types of testing we're gonna talk about. The first is the RT-PCR. This is the most common test that's done today. It's also called the molecular test or a viral test. This is the gold standard in terms of two different characteristics of a test that we look to. One's called sensitivity. That's the ability of a test to detect what you're looking for and the specificity, which means that when you do detect something, it's the thing you're looking for and it's not gonna be something else, not gonna be a false positive. And if it's negative, it isn't gonna be the thing you're looking for, unless of course you tested too soon. If you test sooner than day three for SARS-CoV-2, you may miss it, not because the test is bad, but because there aren't enough viral particles to be detected. Drawbacks to this test, it's not a rapid test. It is rapid in the hospital. We have a one hour test we can do for inpatients, which is still in very limited supply. So we're very careful with how many of those we spend, if you will, but we're making decisions about what treatment people need, whether to put them in isolation or not. So we need a rapid test. So for most outpatients, you're still gonna need a 24 to 72 hour turnaround, sometimes longer, depending on what's happening in the labs. The other drawback to this test is that it can remain positive long after people are no longer infectious. Our best studies and data have shown that when somebody's actually had COVID after about day 10, they're not gonna be able to spread it anymore. But if you test them, they may remain positive for weeks after they're no longer infectious. It's led some people to think that COVID can actually come back. We do know that it, it has come back in a couple of cases based on the actual 
study of the virus itself. But many of those early cases that they thought were re-cases, reinfection, were actually not. It was just a longer period where you can detect the viral particles. Next slide. Antigen testing is another type of testing for COVID. Instead of detecting the molecular products inside the virus, this looks for the protein that is in that club that we're seeing in all those pictures that's on the surface of the virus. The antigen is the thing our body reacts to, reacts to an antigen by producing antibodies. So you can do a test, a rapid test to detect the SARS-CoV-2 antigen. Some companies think, finally, the holy grail. Finally, we have a test where somebody walks up to the gate with their lunch pail and their hard hat or their suit or their briefcase or whatever, gets their nose swab, waits 15 minutes, and gets a green or a red. Unfortunately, it's not a perfect test. You do get a result very quickly, but there are some limitations. First of all, you need a healthcare worker to collect a specimen. Not everybody can be trained to be an expert swabber. If you do this frequently, if you did it every day, or even every week, or even bi-weekly, the costs are going to add up at about, I've seen costs as high as $100 a test. The PCR is usually $150. But the antigen test can be as low as $75. I've seen costs of about uh, 70 or close to $100. But the real bad news with this test is it's much less sensitive than the PCR. In the laboratory setting, it can be as sensitive as 98%, but in the clinical world, probably not better than 80%. What does that mean? More false negative. So the thing you're looking to rule out might not be ruled out. So if you have 100 patients or 100 employees with COVID that you're screening at the gate, at the door with this test, up to 25 of them could screen negative and still be carrying SARS-CoV-2 into your workplace. That's the real problem with the antigen test. There are some that say, we don't need it. The prevalence of this disease in our community, scary as it is, is still low. Those low cost public health hygiene measures, the masks, the hand washing, the distancing are still really effective. And the reassurance from a negative test is very short lived as I'll talk about in a minute. Some don't like the rapid test because of the outbreaks that occurred in and around White House staff, they were using a rapid test to screen their White House staff. And uh, unfortunately, many of them did end up being positive. Next slide. This was a statement that came out from uh, a group that I participate in every two weeks as a meeting of all the occupational medicine and infectious disease doctors across the Penn Medicine System, Chester County Hospital, the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Hospital, Presbyterian, Lancaster, and Princeton get together every two weeks, and we've put out a statement about the value of antigen testing, uh, rapid antigen testing, uh, RAD is just an unfortunate uh, acronym there, that said, again, very insensitive, the best case use they feel is in like a nursing home setting, where you really have a lot of people at risk. But if it's negative in somebody with symptoms, you've got to go ahead and do a PCR anyway. To do it for asymptomatic screening in other groups, not recommended, not recommended. Next slide. We do think eventually that the antigen tests are gonna get better and they may even become kind of like a home pregnancy test where people can do this at home. I'd like the race to be won by vaccines and treatments before we get these developed because it'll mean there isn't any COVID to test for. But just in case the technology is moving forward to develop a home test. If you get a home test, it's gotta be really reliable because now we don't have a healthcare provider interpreting it. You're interpreting it at home the way you interpret a pregnancy test at home. So it's gotta be really easy to use, really easy to understand and really reliable. Next slide, please. A lot of question about testing asymptomatic people. We get a lot of questions from our client companies about testing. When do you test? Who should I test? But what's not often appreciated is the value of a negative test in somebody without symptoms. And my advice to most of the companies that have asked me and my advice to you now is that what I'm calling the reassurance shelf life of a negative test is really very short. In fact, my definition, a very conservative definition of a negative test in an asymptomatic person who's had recent exposures or has ongoing exposures 
A negative test is just a test that's not positive yet. If you're gonna quarantine anyway, I would consider not testing. Well, still a lot of people wanna test. Had a question just two days ago. Somebody was out of the country or in another state, coming back to work, should we get a test at day zero? Well, sure you can, we'd be happy to do it for you and charge you $150 or whatever we charge, but it's just a snapshot. That day they were traveling, that day they were walking through two airports and on a plane, even with a mask, was another exposure scenario. So another 14 day clock starts that day. So testing at day zero is not gonna tell you what's gonna happen at day three or day seven at day 10. What you may wanna do as a gamble, because you're just playing the percentages here, is to test somewhere between day five and seven, we usually say day six. We know that most people that are gonna get COVID after an exposure or after coming from a high risk exposure setting are gonna get it around day six, sometime between day five and seven. So if you test then and it's negative, you can kind of play this 68-32 rule. 68% chance that they're not gonna get it beyond day seven. 32% chance they still will, but that chance goes down every day until about day 14 when it gets to zero. So that is one option we've offered to companies, but it's still a dicey one because the person can still get it after day seven. Next slide. Antibody testing is another type of testing. Now, instead of looking for the piece of the virus or the piece of the virus's antigen, this looks for your body's response to the virus. The antibodies that your body has made to attack the virus. Antibodies can show evidence of previous illness. There are some antibodies that are made right away. They're called IgM that may give you a sense that somebody might still be sick or on the tail end of it. But most time we look for something called IgG, which is a more remote exposure to the virus and your body's response to it. A lot of interest in this in the spring. The hope was that if we know who's had it and we can create this kind of super race of immune COVID immune workers, we can put them in harm's way without the need for distancing, without the need for masks, because they're immune. But we decided it was not a good strategy. Not sure what it means. If immune, how immune are you? How long are you immune? So it's been relegated to another role now, mostly to try to get a sense of how much COVID is out there in the community. And some of these vaccine trials, they're testing everybody with an antibody test to see how much COVID is out there in the population. And we're still looking at numbers that are under 5%, sometimes even low, as low as 1%. We're gonna use antibody testing later, once there's a vaccine, to show how long people have immunity and how immune they are. But right now, not so much with the antibody testing. Next slide, please. Let's get into which treatment now, which test now, which treatment. Remdesivir is the one we've heard most about. The VIR suffix tells you it's an antiviral, like oseltamivir, which is Tamiflu. The VIR is, a, is an indication this is an antiviral medication. This is the one we know best. Originally developed for Ebola, didn't work so well for that, or hepatitis C, but started to use it for um, COVID, for SARS-CoV-2, and originally released under an emergency use authorization, the EUA that said, it may be effective, let's try it. So originally it was only used in certain really sick hospitalized patients that had very low oxygen. And again, this is maybe a life-saving treatment of somebody who could die. It worked so well, people got better faster, lower mortality rate that they, the company Gilead that makes this applied for a new drug application and they were granted it just a couple of weeks ago. Actually not, just last week. FDA approved it, uh, the trade name is Vecluri, for use in adults and pediatric patients, as it says here, only in a hospital setting, but it's irrespective of how sick they are. They don't have to be really sick to get this. The original EUA that authorized it to use in some patients that weighed less than three and a half kilograms and less than 12 can still happen under the EUA, but it's approved for even pediatric patients that are 12 and older. Next slide, please. Monoc or convalescent plasma, again, I, I said earlier, was criticized for being rushed to market because 
the theory makes sense when people have had an illness you draw their blood out they've got antibodies against the illness and you use this to a week say passively immunize other people now this is the way we've used a lot of other antibodies in the past many of you may remember the term horse serum for the way tetanus anti-serum was produced again you give the disease to an animal the animal produces antibodies against it you draw off the animal's serum, the plasma, and give it to the person to give them not their own immunity. This isn't your own antibodies that have reacted against the virus, but it's a passive immunity. We still use passive immunity in a lot of different illnesses. If somebody has been exposed to rabies, we give them a dose of rabies immune globule. Now they're made in the laboratory rather than being taken off of horses necessarily. But uh, we still use passive immunity as we're immunizing somebody to develop their own active immunity. So convalescent plasma was used before there was a lot of data. Article came out uh, just last week. It was published in Medscape, a study done in India. Didn't look so good. Didn't seem like it helped people as much as we had hoped it would. Somebody from the Mayo Clinic commented and said, not sure if it's really as bad as we think because we really didn't know how much antibody was in the plasma. Some of it may have had low titers or no antibodies and it was given very late. Whereas we've known for years that when you're gonna do it, you give it sooner and maybe you give it when you know how much antibody is actually in the plasma. So this Dr. Joyner from Mayo said, doesn't, it's not as discouraging as we think. It looks like a negative study, but at least there are some hints that it might work because even in this study where it wasn't used early enough and we weren't sure how much was there, still worked a little bit. Next slide. Monoclonal antibodies got in the news when President Trump received these uh, from a company uh, that's making these now and is one of the companies that hopes to have a licensed product soon. These are concentrated versions of the convalescent plasma. So you find out what the antibodies to COVID are, you extract those, and then you clone them in your laboratory. You make more of them and give them in a very concentrated dose to people with COVID. So unlike the convalescent plasma, and the hydroxychloroquine that might have been rushed to market, monoclonal antibodies do have some data around them. And so the companies have applied for these EUAs. The risks here, again, political pressure. Dr. Hahn from the FDA said, I promise you, we're only going to use science to make this decision whether they work or not. But if we do have good data under that maybe effective standard for an EUA, we're going to get it out there. We're going to start using it. But he said he would promise us that we're going to let the science and the data decide this. Next slide, please. We're going to get into the vaccine treatment now, or vaccine uh, discussions now, which vaccine. This is Dr. Robert Redfield, director of the CDC, testifying before the Senate back in September about vaccine. And he famously held up his mask and he said, if I had to choose between a vaccine or this, I would take this. And what he was pointing up is that vaccines are not 100% effective. And yet masks and distancing, if not 100% effective, probably more than 50% or 60% or 70%. Next slide, please. There's a lot of vaccine trials underway. There's different phases. First, they try to see if they're safe. In later phases, they actually give them to people to see who gets protected and who gets the vaccine. And it's kind of a chance thing. You try to enroll enough people and the ones being enrolled, the, the trials being conducted now by the, the companies that I've listed here, Moderna, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, Novavax, trying to get, the more people you enroll, the more robust your data are going to be. So if you enroll 30,000 people, you're looking to get 150 events, endpoints of infection. And obviously, you want more events to occur. Well, you don't want events to occur in anybody. But in a study like this, you want the people that get the placebo, the salt water injection, you want the cases to occur in them and not in the people that got your vaccine. The risk here, again, because it's a deadly disease and because we want to get something out there as soon as possible, there's a risk that the companies, or maybe for other reasons, are going to call it sooner call it effective sooner than 150 events. The risk, of course, is that we've got to extrapolate this to tens or hundreds of millions of people. 
So if you make a decision on fewer than 30,000 people in a trial, it's a little riskier. FDA has said they've got to be at least 50% effective. Each company conducting a trial has what's called a DSMB, a data safety and monitoring board, looking at all the results. FDA has want to be sure that there's clear and compelling evidence of safety. And again, we want to be sure we don't let anything interfere with that. And Dr. Hahn says, we're not going to. It's going to be the science and that's it. Next slide. A quick primer on vaccine effectiveness and how we calculate it. Qualitatively, as I said in the last slide, it means we want more cases to occur in the placebo group and in the vaccine group. But there's an actual formula. Vaccine effectiveness expressed as a percentage is the AR, the attack rate in the unvaccinated, that's the small u, minus the attack rate in the vaccinated, the small v, divided by the attack rate in the unvaccinated multiplied by 100. So if you've got 30,000 people approximately and you're looking for 150 cases, the kind of vaccine effectiveness you're gonna measure is gonna look like on the following slide. Next slide. So here are some scenarios looking at number of unvaccinated, number of vaccinated, 30,000 enrollees, and looking for 150 events. The top row and the bottom row are the extremes that we certainly don't expect to see in the first extreme case. All 150 cases occur in the vaccinated group. Very unlikely, probably impossible. But that would mean a vaccine effectiveness of zero not effective at all. The middle rows are intermediate scenarios. The last row is all 150 cases occur in the unvaccinated group. Now we have a vaccine that's 100% effective. Again, an unlikely scenario given what we know, influenza vaccines are not uniformly effective. We all know of cases that occur every year in people that have had the vaccine. So, the FDA for COVID has established a floor of 50% from the trials. And a 50% floor means that 100 cases occur in the unvaccinated group and 50 in the vaccinated group. That's still a lot in the vaccinated group, but that's the bare minimum we will have before the FDA will say that it's effective enough to issue emergency use authorization. Row number two is where you get half as many cases in each group, still 0% effective. Row number four is what we really like to have, at least 80% effective, because it's a realistic goal. 125 cases in the unvaccinated group, 25 in the vaccinated. Again, more than we'd like in the vaccinated group, but rarely is a vaccine 100% effective. So we would take this in a heartbeat. Next slide. A lot of talk and uh, concern recently about adverse events that occur in trials, both related to COVID and non-COVID. There was a death in Brazil with the AstraZeneca trial. Turns out it was a doctor volunteered for the trial. That trial continued. And the assumption is that the reviewers that broke the code to know who got what concluded that this doctor got the placebo. Now, again, horrible. We don't want anybody to get COVID or die because of this. But in a weird way, if somebody in the placebo group gets COVID, it's proof of concept. This means the vaccination is working if many fewer people in the vaccination group don't get it. There was a well-known publicized case in the UK of a, something called transverse myelitis, inflammation of the spinal cord. And again, that poor AstraZeneca trial stopped that for a while. One of the problems with adverse events is that when you've got a large enough population of people that are being tested, there's going to be a certain number that gets sick for other reasons anyway. So something like transverse myelitis occurs with a certain frequency in the population, whether there's COVID or not, whether there's a COVID vaccine or not. So the challenge for the researchers is to figure out what were the chances be that somebody just randomly would get transverse myelitis, whether they were getting a vaccine or not. And if it looks as if, gee, you know, two people out of 15,000 usually get this anyway, and now we have one person out of 15,000, it's unlikely to have been due to the vaccine. Not impossible, just unlikely. And you make a bet. So that study was paused for a while, 
and then resumed, at least in the UK, still hasn't been resumed here in the US. Vaccine trials also have something called stopping rules, which is a good thing. If we see overwhelming evidence early on that nobody in the vaccine group is getting COVID and all the COVID cases are occurring in the unvaccinated group, we stop. And we do this for any drug trial where we see that the benefit appears overwhelming. We stop the trial and say, this is good, get it licensed, get it out there. Hopefully we'll see something like that for COVID. Next slide. This, this slide looks at the timeline we expect for the vaccines. It is kind of a race. Uh, the Moderna is probably gonna get licensed sooner than the AstraZeneca but it's, it's kind of a race, we're not sure yet. The Moderna is a different type of vaccine as is the Pfizer, which is probably gonna come in the first quarter of 2021. They're using pieces of the virus's RNA. In fact, that's even in the name of the Moderna company to inject into people and actually take over the cells machinery to produce the antigens that the virus produces, now they're getting produced on our own cells, and now your body attacks your cells that have that antigen. They're actually just attacking the antigen, but their attack involves a production of antibodies, which is what we want. So that's a brand new technology for creating viruses. Usually we give a dead virus or a weakened virus to people, the whole thing, to get them to stimulate production of antibodies. The AstraZeneca trial uses another technology. In this case, they're using another virus called adenovirus to carry that RNA into our cells. Anyway, this is a timeline we're hoping last quarter of this calendar year, early 2021, to actually have a vaccine available. Next slide. This is a picture of Dr. Paul Offit. Uh, you may have seen him on some interview. I'm not gonna read all the bullet, point here, the bullet points here. But he is kind of the guru for, for vaccines. He's a pediatric infectious disease specialist. We're fortunate to have such an expert so close to us. He's part of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine on vaccinology. And he's also a well-known expert interviewed on CNN and other places about the COVID vaccine. But in a recent interview with Medscape in September, he said that what's keeping him up at night is that the vaccines will distract people from the hygienic measures. Sort of the same thing Dr. Redfield from the CDC said. If the vaccine's 75% effective, he said, one out of four people can still get very sick. But I know that if I'm six feet away from somebody with the virus and we're both wearing masks, my chances of getting this are probably about zero. So he's afraid that we're gonna pay less attention to the hygienic measures, which he feels that of our two tools, is as, it says, as he says here, arguably the more important tool to use. He's afraid we're gonna forget about them once we have a vaccine. We shall see. Next slide, please. Here's how we think the vaccines are gonna be distributed. This probably, this graph probably approximates calendar year 2021 or late 2020 into 2021 when we think there's gonna be a limited supply at first. So we're only gonna prioritize it for the at-risk people, the ones that are in congregate living settings that are older than 65 or 65 and older with comorbid conditions, bad heart disease or lung disease, and also first line, front line rather caregivers. They're going to be the first recipients of the vaccine. As we get into the late spring, early summer and the fatter part of that graph there or the higher part of the graph, more widely available, that's when we're going to hopefully be able to distribute this broadly, get it into doctor's offices, public health clinics, and so forth. Next slide. Once we have the vaccination, it's still not just let's go get it. There's a lot of work that has to be done to make sure we prioritize it correctly. When we have limited supply, reach out to the people that need it, schedule them for their vaccines, give them the vaccines. These vaccines, actually the ones that we think are going to get there first, the Moderna and the Pfizer, need two doses. And they also need to be kept at sub-zero temperatures up until the time they're administered. So it's not an easy process to get these into people you know, just by snapping your fingers. Next slide, please. 
If you want to keep as up to date as you can with all the news that's fit to print, the New York Times has two different sites that track vaccines and treatments. And these are really up to date here. If there's been a vaccine adverse effect, they'll have it. A new drug that's been approved, they'll have it. And you can see for the drug tracker, the box on the far left, which is sort of a darker green, was zero until just last week, until we got remdesivir approved. And as soon as that was approved, we got the one. For the vaccine tracker approved, it's still zero because there are no approved vaccine yet, but hopefully soon. Anyway, a great site for keeping up to date. Next slide. One of the things we know we're gonna to have to do better with, with flu vaccine, and this speaks to some of the social justice issues that have been so prominent uh, paralleling what's happening with COVID as we know that people in socioeconomic disadvantaged status, people of color are getting COVID more frequently and having worse COVID cases. We know from our history with flu vaccine distribution that Hispanic and black have been those, those lower two curves, haven't gotten it as readily as people in the, the white population and just overall. So we've got to do better with COVID for some of the racial and ethnic minorities that weren't advantaged with the flu vaccine. Next slide, please. Just a word about something that's kind of a scary concept, but it's out there and may come to this country. Something called challenge trials. When we do the other vaccine trials, we are giving people vaccine or salt water injections and then seeing what happens. Just putting them out there in the world and seeing if they get it or they don't get it. In these trials, you're actually giving people the virus. You're gonna infuse some of SARS-CoV-2 into people to challenge them and see if the vaccine you gave them or the treatment you have available is effective. Obviously ethical issues here when you're dealing with a deadly disease. They're planned, however, to be starting in the UK after January. Here in this country, we're still trying to figure out how we would do it and what the ethical implications would be. And again, hopefully we have a vaccine that we're so confident about we don't need to do the challenge trials, but it's out there as something you might hear about. Next slide, please. This is something I never thought I would see back in March when this all started. An announcement on the left from the Pennsylvania Department of Health for vaccine providers, an invitation to submit information about the vaccine providers in your facility, in your clinic, in your doctor's office they're compiling a list of licensed, licensed providers, physicians, and advanced practice clinicians to actually get the first allotments of vaccine once it's available. The key phrase I think in this that I find fascinating is in anticipation. We don't have the vaccine yet, but we are so confident we're going to have it that we're getting our ducks in a row. On the right is an email I received last Friday, actually that date's wrong. It should have been the 23rd. From our director of regulatory affairs here at Chester County Hospital sent to all the senior management, my name's on there, Mike Duncan's name is on there, that we sent our application to the state and we're waiting to get the vaccine. Shafina's, that name mentioned there, is Dr. Shafina's Octor who is our infection control physician here that's been leading our COVID efforts. And she's gonna be getting a team together here that's gonna be our vaccine implementation team. Don't expect it till mid-December to mid-January, but the thing is, it's happening. We are going to get vaccine and we're getting our ducks in a row to be ready when it gets here. Next slide. We've heard a lot about herd immunity as well. And this is a little bit about how that works depicted here with the pictures on the bottom when there's no immunity to an illness in the herd, something novel is introduced, no immunity and so many cases occur. The middle is some people are starting to get immune and once you're immune, you can't catch it. But what we really want is a picture on the right where most people are immune and now the virus can't spread anymore, it can't spread to somebody who's immune to it. And then the virus eventually dies out. Ranges, as it says here, for herd immunity is at 55% to 82% of the population being immune will get us to herd immunity. It's too long a road 
if you wait for people to just get the illness, it's going to be years. That's why we need the vaccine to jump start our, our pathway to herd immunity. And then we're going to get those high numbers sooner rather than later. Next slide, please. This is a slide may be familiar to people that knew who Monty Python's Flying Circus was. Back in the, I guess it was 70s, I'm sorry to say, they had a television show, a number of movies. But whenever they switched gears, they would say, and now for something completely different. And let's switch gears here and go to the next slide. We're gonna talk a little bit about medical marijuana. Back in March with COVID just starting, governor issued an emergent disaster proclamation, but he added to that in later March concerning medical marijuana. He said that dispensaries are essential businesses and he suspended the part of the law that says you can only get your medical marijuana inside the dispensary. This suspension of the law said you can now get curbside delivery. And that meant dispensary employees could go to your vehicle, see your card, go back inside, get the product and bring it back out to you. The other part of this is the physician certification process. The law says it's gotta be an in-person consultation. We all know that when COVID hit, a lot of medical evaluations occurred by telemedicine. So they changed in-person to allow it by telemedicine as well for new consultations. They also said people could have a larger supply, 90 days rather than 30. And these suspensions would remain in place as long as the disaster proclamation is in effect and the governor uh, doubled down on that back in September. Next slide, please. Philadelphia Inquirer had an article in late August that talked about the medical marijuana business in Pennsylvania, how it essentially was booming. More visits to dispensaries between February and August, you can see the big jump there. Dispensaries were selling as much just in that six month interval as they had in the previous two years combined and made, or patients were spending rather, close to 400 million at the dispensaries. And up until that time from the inception of the program in 2016, that was as much as they'd spent in that whole time. So obviously an explosion, if you will, um, in medical marijuana use, ironically, the economy got worse and medical marijuana expenditures got higher. Next slide, please. Some of it we feel was driven by COVID related anxiety. This grower processor in Clinton County said, cannabis obviously is a, a substance people go to to cope with anxiety. And we know that anxiety was added to the state's list of covered conditions a couple of years ago. And now it's one of the most cited reasons for getting a state medical marijuana card. Chronic pain is still first. Marijuana is now second in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, believe it or not, a distant third. So naming these dispensaries as essential businesses, easing the regulations, more Pennsylvanians now have medical marijuana cards. We know that some of them were spending their $600 unemployment cares benefit on medical marijuana because of the effect on anxiety. Next slide, please. This is some advice to employers from an employment law firm called Reed Smith, talking again about what's happened in Pennsylvania. Surveys done to show a lot more people with anxiety specifically related to COVID compared to benchmarks. Their survey, this uh, survey that was done to assess the effect of coronavirus on mental health showed that 32% of the respondents reported anxiety related to COVID and the benchmark was something like 8.2%. The expectation is this is gonna get worse if we get more COVID. If the cases spike as the CDC graph shows they are, certainly we hope they don't, but if they do, there might be more COVID related anxiety and a corresponding increase in individuals that are gonna use medical marijuana to treat it. Next slide. Message to employers, tighten up your workplace policies. You're gonna see more medical marijuana. Make sure you have policies that address medical marijuana, assuming you're not governed by the DOT. Make sure you don't discriminate against people just because they have cards, but you have policies in place to make sure that people that have adverse events for medical marijuana and that appear impaired can be handled. Some employers, we've been contacted by a number of employers that 
do a lot of drug testing, again, non-DOT, they'll want to take marijuana out of their out of their protocols. Mm -hmm. Too many employees are using it for medical reasons or recreationally still. And they just say, we don't even want to test for it anymore. We can't field a team. We can't maintain a workforce if we continue to test for marijuana. So that's something we're seeing. Next slide, please. So something about what's happening in our program, which I'm calling here an odd alignment of stars. There's been more demand for medical marijuana. There are physicians in the Penn Medicine system here in Westchester that are certified to document that somebody has a covered condition and authorize them to get their medical marijuana card. One of the doctors is doing a lot of this and he's doing it for a lot of other practices is retiring in February. There's another one, one of our doctors in the hospital that uh, does it at our cancer center. A lot of cancer patients that have chronic cancer pain are candidates that's a covered condition under the state and they use medical marijuana. He's been doing it for them, but his bandwidth is somewhat constrained given the demand. So there's a need created in our community for more physicians to certify for medical marijuana use. And then the way the stars align for us, we hired a doctor back in November that uh, is working in our clinic, but also working in student health, not to get into this in too much detail, but our program provides the physician staffing for Westchester University student health program. So happened this doctor is a certified doctor for medical marijuana and was doing it in another practice where she was. Her name is Dr. Vita Mani. And some of the patients that used her before wanted to know where she was because they wanted to see her again because you gotta be recertified every year. And she asked us, can I do this in the clinic here? And we said, well, I guess so. It does seem a little bit odd for us because it isn't something that we've been doing. Next slide but we let her start doing it as kind of a soft opening of a medical marijuana service. We even asked ourselves this question, isn't this a little bit odd for us because of all the drug testing we do? Because medical, because marijuana is still the number one positive result that we see, most of it still recreational, but some of it medical. The reports that we see are that are positive. When I talk to the employees that use it, sometimes they say, I am using it medically, but I ran out of my card or I never got a card. If we see it in a DOT driver, we have to disqualify them. If it's in a non-DOT driver, it's up to the employer policy. But what I say here is that as odd as it is for us to be certifying our patients for medical marijuana use, it's really no odder than prescribing opiates and opioids. We see a lot of opioid positive drug screens. We disqualify a lot of people with opioid positive drug tests but we still prescribe it. If somebody's got a broken bone or a ruptured disc that's really hot, Motrin and Tylenol might not cut it. So we still prescribe opioids. So the answer here to opioids isn't necessarily abolishing their use, but prescribing them selectively, thoughtfully. Medical marijuana is the same way or can be approached the same way. And it could be an alternative, maybe a safer alternative to opioids in people with chronic pain. The physician that's retiring, I spoke to, he said, you know, there's a need. So we're doing it now. And not, you know, we're not advertising it. We're not putting, uh, you're not actually allowed to advertise it, uh, put ads in the paper or anything. But we're letting our clients know that if it's something that one of their employees needs, there's a state list of doctors that do this. They're free to consult that list, but we're on there too, if they want to choose us. We feel it's an opportunity to do this thoughtfully and to do some good with it. Next slide. Well, the poetic influence is coming back. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Sam Hain. I mentioned uh, William Butler Yeats in the earlier slides, the Irish poet from the early 20th century. He wrote a lot of poetry about the fairy people, the little people. And there's a holiday that's been celebrated in the British Isles for many years, for centuries actually, called Sam Hain. Comes probably from an old pagan festival, but adopted by the Scottish and Irish Gaelic speaking people as sort of an end of harvest, start of winter, beginning of darker times festival. It occurs between the autumn equinox and the winter solstice, the so-called mid-cycle feast, there are others of those. But being in this sort of a mid-cycle time, it's seen as what's sometimes called a liminal time, a boundary time where the worlds of the dead and the worlds of the living come a little closer together. 
the veil between those worlds gets thinner. I've got some pictures here on the right of Samhain festivals. The one on the bottom is our Sarah Pivita with her, her fellow Wicca people that are having their usual annual bonfire for uh, Samhain. But for centuries, these, that was a joke. These, these have been going on. Uh, these veils get thinner. The people from the world of the spirits, from the world of the dead, can cross over into the world of the living. living. So what do the people in the world of the living do? They put on costumes. They disguise themselves as people from the world of the dead. And we go around doing something called mumming, which relates to our more familiar term of mummers and mummering. They would go door to door, recite verses, recite poetry, sing maybe in exchange for a treat for food. The point though was to imitate the spirits as a disguise, as something to keep you from being carried back into the world of the dead. If you look like somebody who came from that world, those spirits are less likely to grab you and carry you back. Now, of course, these habits were co-opted by the Christians in the ninth century, became much more familiar feasts here, All Hallows Eve or what we call Halloween, All Hallows Day, which Christians and Catholics especially call All Saints Day, and then November 2nd, All Souls Day. So the practices of Samhain and Halloween merged. Next slide. So here's somebody you might see in a Samhain festival, disguised as somebody from the world of the dead. But now the risks from the world of the dead have been amplified by the risks of COVID. So I'm pulling it all together here. And the fact that bats may have carried it tells us that this person might be better off wearing a mask than just having her costume from the world of the dead. Anyway, I think that's it. Next slide. That's the ending slide. So